Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Live with me, Rosa Stengo. Well, today we're talking about the environment, parks, oil spills, air quality, just some of the topics uh, we're talking about. And joining me in the studio, you're very familiar with him, it's the Minister for the Environment, Professor John Cortez. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. Good to have you back with with us. Um, right, well, we're going to jump straight into mm-hmm. it with, um, I think, the story that caused the most um, controversy recently is Midtown Park. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask you some questions about yep. that. In Parliament, you stated that the cost was £3.7 million so far. Yep. Uh, by comparison, the considerably bigger Commonwealth Park cost £5.6 million, but only £3.4 million was paid from the public purse. The rest mm-hmm. of it was made up by EU grants and yeah. the Kazuma Trust. So how can you justify spending so much money mm. um, on a relatively small area, certainly in comparison to Commonwealth Park? Well, don't I wish we still had access to EU funds, but that's another subject on its own. Um, Midtown Park um, had, we, I think we estimated about two and a half million for it. But we came across a number of problems. One of them was the fact that it was built on the site of an old power station. And there were hard concrete bases of the engines and there was a lot of fuel in the soil. Didn't that come out in a survey beforehand? Uh, This was not expected to have been uh, as bad as it was. Um, And therefore that added uh, about six to seven hundred thousand pounds in having to deal with that and having to deal with the contaminated soil and get it taken away to a, to a safe location um, across outside Gibraltar. Um, apart from that, the delay due to COVID meant uh, that there were considerable uh, expenses in, in keeping workforce, what they call out-of-sequence working when you, you, you don't do it in the order that it makes sense to, to, to do it. So you have added costs and they added to about £85,000. And then obviously we we also included the the new canopies uh, and the sunshade in uh, King's Bastion and the play area. And this all added up to about the million or so more than we had expected. Uh, people have compared this with the price of building a park in UK. It's very, very different. We have to bring trees from France because nobody will bring the kind of trees of the size uh, from any closer. We have to import a lot of our material. Again, COVID meant that there were lots of delays. So, I mean, I wish we could have done it for less. What I can say is that it's already looking great and people will use it. And it will be, I think, just as welcome as Commonwealth Park now is. We we heard the same things about Commonwealth Park. Everybody now do loves you, it. Do you, um, do you get, though, that people are saying in, in these economic times of difficulty Glad to spend £3.7 million on a small area, although it does look wonderful, perhaps that money could have been better spent? Well, remember that this was planned before we knew we were going to have this economic hit. Um, so we cannot use that argument. Um, it's not that small an area. Uh, and when the trees go bigger, it will certainly look like a bigger area. Remember that this area will have a, it has deliberately got a tiled area so that we can do cinemas, we can do events, we can do Christmas fairs or, 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 or whatever um, there without spoiling the grass, which is very, very expensive then to repair. So it's going to be wonderful. And if then, you know, the number of people using Commonwealth Park if you, uh, is, is tremendous. So that is money well spent. Uh, I think people in a couple of years' time will forget this conversation and really enjoy using it. Okay, um, we have GBC has asked you for a mm-hmm. breakdown. I know the opposition parties yeah. has asked you for a breakdown. When are you going to publish a breakdown of the costs of uh, Midtown? Has it has it exceeded the three point seven million? Uh, so the the final account is expected to be around three point eight. So right. so we're not expecting any more. Um, I've given the breakdown, for example, in breaking out the old power station, 250,000, removal of the contaminated soil, 390,000, out of sequence, 85,000. Um, so there is a breakdown. If you need a more detailed breakdown, well, I'll give you a more detailed breakdown. Um, yeah, because that doesn't add up to 3.7. So I think the no, public no, no. might want to see how, how it comes to that. Um, sure. I mean, the, the works were done by GJBS um, and they would have used subcontractors for all the different things. The play park is a very special play park. It's different to any play park in Gibraltar and that was designed in UK by UK consultants. Um, I think 
children will love using it. Let's talk about the trees and the grass. Mm-hmm. The grass, there were some issues with the grass. It was uh, planted um, and then it okay. was removed and, and there aren't as many trees as you originally right. foresaw. Um, it looked like we were going to be able to fit in around 80 trees, but then the design sl- changed slightly at Modito stage, which happens in every project, uh, to give more open areas. So it dropped to 47 uh, we've planted nearly 200 trees around Gibraltar in the last year and a half. So, you know, we've more than compensated for that. The grass was is, is very simple. Because of the delays, we weren't able to get the, uh, the COVID delays. We weren't able to get the grass, which has to be planted at a particular time of year, into Gibraltar from the specialist uh, in UK, which is the same type of grass that has been so successful in Commonwealth Park. So it was a question of either getting another turf and lay it temporarily, which will not just look good, it'll produce oxygen, but also will stop dust blowing all over the place in the centre of town or leaving it just as a dusty piece of ground. And where's that turf now gone? That turf is now in the Red Sands area, in the planted areas, largely around uh, Alameda Estate, and there's also some within the Alameda Gardens. Okay, can we talk about the um, maintenance contract? Mm -hmm. Um, Did that go out to tender? The the maintenance contract is an extension of the contract of Commonwealth Park, which did go out to tender, Um, and it it made sense uh, because it's a, a small extension in relation to additional resources, because all the resources are there, the, the labor's there, the equipment is there, the materials are there. So it was an extension of a contract of Commonwealth Park, which went to tender at the time. So that contract is for Wildlife Gibraltar, yep. a company that you're very familiar with. Of course, uh, your, I created it. Exactly, you created it. Your wife is a director. You stepped down mm-hmm. um, when you became a minister. Can I ask you, do you or your wife benefit either directly or indirectly from any money received from the government into wildlife Gibraltar for the maintenance of those parks? Not at all. Absolutely zero. I can go further. When I created the company back in 1991, um, we had a government contract as a private company. We could have made a profit. We could have had uh, dividends. We could have uh, shared profits. It has been run since day one as non-profit making, as an NGO virtually, no money other than my pay, which was agreed with the government and has been agreed uh, by successive government, went into my pocket or my wife's pocket. My wife has never received a penny and I have never received a penny other than my pay, even when I was a managing director of a private company. Um, and now even less. There is absolutely no money come my way and I could prove it uh, very, very easily. So that is absolutely nonsensical. Very few companies are run like that. I am very proud to say that whenever... I have been given taxpayers' money. I have put it into the gardens or into the work that I've been doing. There's absolutely no truth in that at all. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Let's move on to another subject now, oil spills. We've had two oil spills this year, and um, I I know that you said it was quite a rare occurrence, but it was interesting looking at the Nautilus project and the ESG, and they tend to have a different view that uh, these, perhaps not, on that kind of scale, perhaps smaller, they, they do occur quite uh, quite often. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I don't think that, that my friends from ESG and Nautilus um, and fellow uh, warriors for the environment and I disagree on this. Uh, I meant that we don't have large oil spills very regularly and we don't. Yes, that's We've had the first one and then a, a second one which was smaller than the first one that we've had this year. That was very unfortunate. It... Um, caused me a great deal of concern and grief. I'm glad to say that all the parties came out uh, and helped and deal with it, but clearly we don't want them to happen. Do we have any more information on how that second oil spill happened? Because at the time there was uncertainty, wasn't there? I haven't got any more information. I am awaiting uh, results, but it doesn't seem to be attributable to anything that happened locally. Okay. And And there is another thing that I want to mention because Mm -hmm. people often see a sheen in the water in the naval base area and they think it's a new oil spill. Sadly, that appears to be uh, historic um, oil in the ground from the various activities, both civilian and military in the past. And sadly, when it rains, it seems to fill up the drains and out it comes. We're trying to deal with it. But that is not the same as the oil spill we had, which came from from bunkering. Okay, and in terms of the investigations as a result of those spills, and um, uh, have you received all the reports that you need to get back? And are there any lessons that we need to learn? 
I think there's still some information to come, but I think the, the lesson is always in anything environment, and I'm not embarrassed to say this, we can always do better. Um, I think that all the different agencies cooperated very well. Um, I think that they, they did it as quickly as they were able to. But if anything, I think communication perhaps will improve. In fact, we've already set up systems to improve this. Um, but an oil spill is always a terrible, terrible thing to see. And, and uh, it's unfortunate. It happens. Accidents sadly do happen. Um, and just, I just hope that it's, it's uh, something that's not going to happen again in a long, long time. OK, let's move on to um, air pollution. We will we'll talk about bunkering a, uh, a little yep. bit later on as well. Um, we can encompass the whole lot together. But uh, traffic is one of the main contributors to it is now. poor quality. Shipping as well mm -hmm. is another. Um, so what can you tell us about the latest readings? OK, um, w when I became Minister for the Environment, I was aware that we had three uh, things to tackle. Power generation, which was the urgent one and probably the one that was easier to tackle. Uh, traffic and shipping. We have dealt largely with power generation. It's not as green as solar or renewables, but we're working on that as well. And we've got traffic, which is a problem, and shipping, which is a problem. However, um, and I'm using 2019 figures now because 2020 with, with lockdowns, we know emissions were lower than, 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 than we would have expected. For the first time in 2017, our uh, monitoring stations recorded uh, levels of nitrogen dioxide, which is one of the key uh, indicators, to be lower than the EU um, uh, desired level, which is 40 micrograms per cubic meter. And it's progressively been dropping so that in 2019, even before our lockdown, uh, we were down to, I think it was around 37, 38. So our air quality is improving. I'm not saying that I'm sitting back and saying it's wonderful air quality. I'm not, but I can prove it. I've got the figures here. This is soon going to be published. Okay, that that's pre-lockdown. This is pre-lockdown. Do you have this anything? This is after 2019. Mm. We're awaiting the 2020 results. Okay. They, 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 there is a little bit of a time lag. They normally arrive in June, so I'm expecting them any minute now from our consultants. But because of lockdown, air quality was better last year. Uh, because of, there were fewer people on the roads. Okay, well, you've had these uh, monitoring pods yep. placed in certain areas um, on Rosier Road. I don't know if that, does that capture the jib dock area it as does. well? It does, yes. Okay. Are you satisfied that we're using the best pods that we can? Because certainly, uh, that you know, it could capture, particularly for that area where you can see uh, particles in the air, you know, from the paint and everything. It doesn't really capture all of that, does we've, it? We've actually carried out a specific study on paint in the area, which I'm hoping to be able to publish soon so that's a special study with special detectors for paint so that covers that one um, <laughs> the possibilities are endless we have more monitors than the EU would require us to have I'd love to have a lot more they are expensive uh, we have different systems we have a diffusion system which is more passive we have the active monitoring stations and we have our new AQ mesh pods um, which are almost an in between the two uh, but I don't need monitors to tell me that we've got to improve our air quality. I can tell you that. I mean, I recognize we've got to improve our air quality. I think we've done a lot. This, I always say this. There's a lot more to do. I just want to go on to the yep. paint again before we move on to the mm -hmm. pods. Um, those that live in the South District will know that you get micro yes, spots I of know. paint in your car. I live in the South District. Has that have measures been mitigated yes. at Jibdoc? Yes, we we've been working with Jibdoc, uh, and it's for Jibdoc to defend themselves as a private company. I'm just going to tell you the facts. We've been working with them. I know that they have improved a lot of the paint systems, having some protected area uh, protection over uh, when when they paint. Um, it may or may not work every time. Um, we have got them to get uh, UK people to have a look at improving their methodology um, and there have been certain conditions Im imposed on them. This is an ongoing process, uh, but we are uh, certainly very, very conscious of, of potential problems there. OK, in terms of traffic, let me just ask you, do you think the government is doing enough to encourage people to use other forms of tri uh, transport? We hear a lot from the cycling lobby. Yeah, they have a go at me all the time on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. But, but one of them won't come to see me. One of them did, and we had a great conversation, but the invitation is there. I, I, I always say that no government uh, anywhere in the world is doing enough for the environment. Um, and I, I don't shy away from that because there's always more possibilities. Um, I think we can 
and we are planning to do more to encourage cycling and walking. Certainly walking, uh, which is an area which, which I'm very keen on with our national trails and other things like that. We're trying to encourage it. There's been a recent um, uh, initiative by my friend and colleague Vijay Daryanani on a cycling association, and I know that he has lots of plans. So this but is still removed, work in progress. We've removed import duties on cars for, I, I don't know whether they're being reinstated, but, you know, they that's should be. They counter, should be. countermeasure, that, though, yeah, isn't that, it? Yeah, that, that was for other reasons. That was, you know, for, for economic reasons to mm. keep the economy going during lockdown. And, and we, ha- we need to have a healthy economy in order to invest in environmental initiatives. So this is, it's the same with bunkering. Mm. Um, if we were to shut our bunkering down now and it weren't going to go anywhere, then I'd shut it down tomorrow, but it's going to grow across the bay or across the straits. So we have to look at other ways of encouraging LNG bunkering, of being able to ensure that we are on top uh, of any measures in the international bunkering industry to improve their act and and, and to keep working at it. Um, but yes, uh, certainly. In, in terms of monitoring the um, air quality, I know you can go onto a website, yeah. which is airqualitygibraltar.g, I think it is. And in fact, I did print out um, a reading today. But what I wanted to ask you was, you know, it's not it's not very user friendly for the public, isn't it? I mean, wh- where are they? Can, can, can the public, particularly on a day that's really heavy yeah. with smells, can't we just go and see it and read it ourselves? Uh, no, because it, it takes uh, a specialist to, to, to interpret the exactly. monitor itself. Should we not have more user-friendly? I think the website, uh, and I've told, the, the, this is done by UK specialists who are actually very good at it. Um, but I agree, and it's been mentioned to me before, that it should be more user-friendly, that it should be easier to interpret. I absolutely agree, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to achieve that. OK, very quickly, the waste treatment plant. Um, a contract was signed £20 million, £22 million pounds yeah. a couple of years ago. What's happening with this? Because it seems to be an ongoing saga. This has been a nightmare, uh, and, and I'm really, really upset about it because... We've had so many things in place. Years ago, we had the opportunity of uh, the European Investment Bank, which was going to finance it. Then we dropped out of the EU and, and investment disappeared overnight after a lot of work had done in it, on it, had been done on it. Then we had the tender awarded to a, a joint venture between Modern Water and Northumbrian Water, which is a co-owner of Aquajib. And after the pre-contract works were done and all the planning was done, Modern Water went into liquidation. So that went out the window. Then there was all sorts of legal wrangles as to whether we could just um, give it to one, to the other, where we would have to tender again. So we've been plagued by lots of administrative problems, which are really as frustrating to me as to anybody else. So have we not made any progress then? We have made progress because now we're looking at three alternative ways of dealing with this, and we're actively discussing it. We're very, very conscious that that this is a, 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 a responsibility and that we have to do it. So... Um, we are looking at different options in detail now to try and once and for all push this forward. OK, I can't believe how fast the time has gone, Dr. John again, Godless. You want. We, <laughs> I definitely need to have you on again. We're also going to be having your shadow opposite Elliot Phillips for an interview as well to see what his concerns are. Delighted to put him right on anything in And then we'll have you both, uh, both <laughs> together as well. So thank you very much for joining My us pleasure. here on Lunchtime Live on Radio.